This presentation will discuss Dr. Peter Steiger's exciting auditory neuroscience research on the trafficking of autotoxic drugs across the blood labyrinth barrier into the inner ear. We will cover two topics. How are molecules, such as aminoglycoside antibiotics, trafficked across the blood labyrinth barrier into endolymph and hair cells? And how can drug trafficking across the blood labyrinth barrier be modulated? Aminoglycoside antibiotics are used intravenously to treat severe bacterial infections such as meningitis, respiratory infections in cystic fibrosis, and septicemia. Clinically relevant aminoglycosides include gentamicin, tobramycin, amikacin, and canamycin. These antibiotics are autotoxic drugs that can cause deafness in premature infants and patients with systemic inflammation. And Dr. Steiger's research is key to understanding how autotoxic drugs, such as aminoglycosides, move from blood vessels into cochlear fluids and hair cells. This cartoon shows a classic cross-sectional diagram of the cochlea, with the four rows of hair cells in yellow, in the organ of corti, and the lateral wall containing the highly vascularized stria vascularis in gray-blue, and the spiral ligament shown in light gray. There are also three fluid-filled compartments, two with paralymph shown in light blue, which contain the typical composition of extracellular fluids that are high in sodium and low in potassium. In contrast, endolymph in white has unique electrochemical composition that is high in potassium and low in sodium. The high potassium molarity endows endolymph with a positive polarity of plus 80 millivolts that is responsible for sensitive hearing. During development, tight junctions are formed to keep the electrochemical composition of endolymph and paralymph distinctly separate, and tight junctions are also formed between all adjacent epithelial cells lining the scala media and between the marginal cells and basal cells of the stria vascularis. In addition, the capillaries of the cochlea are not fenestrated as they are in the liver and muscles and cochlear capillaries also have tight junctions between them, forming the first component of the blood labyrinth barrier. In the 1980s, Tranban Hui and colleagues infused rats with aminoglycosides to determine the kinetics of autotoxic drug uptake in the inner ear. After the infusion, they observed that aminoglycosides were readily detected in paralymph, but not in endolymph and they also detected aminoglycosides in hair cells prior to the loss of hair cell function and hair cell death. During this same time frame in the 1980s, in vitro studies by Kroos and Hudspeth and colleagues demonstrated that aminoglycosides were efficient blockers of the mechanoelectrical transduction or MET channel that is located on the tips of stereocilia, and this led to substantial confusion about how aminoglycosides were entering hair cells. In 2005, Walter Marcotti, Van Netten, and Korn Kroos demonstrated that aminoglycosides not only blocked the MET channels, but also permeated through these channels into hair cells in the now classic in vitro experiments of MET channel physiology. In this image, you can see that hair cell uptake of red fluorescently labeled gentamicin along the organ of corti can be blocked by the MET channel blocker curare. And these data were followed up by a number of investigators who showed that the extent of hair cell death was dependent on hair cell uptake of aminoglycosides via the MET channels. However, these studies were in vitro experiments, and important questions remained. For example, do intravascular aminoglycosides enter cochlear hair cells from endolymph or paralymph? And how do these drugs cross the blood labyrinth barrier? In 2009, Dr. Steiger and his colleagues gave mice systemic injections of fluorescent gentamicin, obtained cross-sections of the cochlea, and found that gentamicin, which for the remainder of this talk will be referred to as GTTR, was primarily localized in the stria vascularis. And GTTR was also localized in the stereocilia and the endolymphatic surface of outer hair cells, pillar cells, and inner hair cells within 30 minutes. Given these results, Dr. Steiger and his team wanted to determine whether aminoglycosides were entering hair cells from paralymph or from the stria vascularis and endolymph.
to test whether intravascular aminoglycosides are primarily trafficked across the streal blood labyrinth barrier into endolymph and hair cells, Dr. Steiger's team developed two in vivo cochlear perfusion paradigms. In the first paradigm, they systemically administered fluorescent GTTR and simultaneously perfused the scala tympani to bathe the basal lateral membranes of hair cells with artificial paralymph. This removed any GTTR that may enter the scala tympani, and after 30 minutes, they found that GTTR strongly labeled the stria vascularis, and strikingly, also prominently labeled hair cells. When they did the reverse experiment, perfusing the paralymphatic scala tympani with artificial paralymph containing a generous level of GTTR for 30 minutes, they found little fluorescence in the stria vascularis and weak fluorescence in the hair cells despite being bathed in GTTR on their basal lateral surfaces for 30 minutes. When you look at these images side by side, you can see that the uptake of GTTR that had to cross the blood labyrinth barrier in vivo is much stronger than the GTTR that was infused into the paralymphatic scala tympani. Additionally, the compound action potentials for these guinea pigs were retained before and after cochlear perfusions, demonstrating the fluorescence data was obtained while the cochlea was still in an active sensitive physiological condition. So far, the data indicate that systemic aminoglycosides are predominantly trafficked across the streal blood labyrinth barrier into the endolymph prior to entering hair cells. The next question is, which mechanisms facilitate aminoglycoside trafficking across the streal endothelial barrier into cochlear tissues? Potential trafficking mechanisms include transcytosis, which can be a mixture of endocytosis, exocytosis, or pinocytosis. There is also the possibility of aminoglycosides trafficking into the streal interstitium via ion channels. And the Steiger lab also recently reported that sodium transporters, like the sodium glucose transporter 2, can traffic aminoglycosides into cells. There are also paracellular trafficking mechanisms, such as leaky tight junctions. And finally, the endothelial barrier can also break down during inflammation. When cytotoxic compounds are released from immune cells, they can disrupt the endothelial cell barrier and allow aminoglycosides to move from capillaries into the streal interstitium. While these are several ways by which aminoglycosides can escape the streal capillary lumen, these mechanisms do not explain how aminoglycosides could cross the streal blood labyrinth barrier. The next portion of this presentation will review the known and potential mechanisms that allow aminoglycosides to move from the capillaries in the stria vascularis into the cochlear endolymph. Let's take a closer look at an enlarged view of the stria vascularis. This illustration of the stria vascularis shows a capillary adjacent to intermediate cells and basal cells. These cells are connected by gap junctions. And over here are the marginal cells and endolymph. When the vasculature is infused with aminoglycosides, these drugs can escape the capillary lumen via ion channels as we discussed recently, or via electrogenic sodium symporters. From there, they likely permeate the intermediate cells through gap junctions. Next, the aminoglycosides must somehow escape from either endothelial cells or intermediate cells into the intrastreal space via electrogenic transporters, ion channels, or other mechanisms as yet unidentified. The most challenging part of this process is the uptake of aminoglycosides by the basal lateral membranes of marginal cells which are highly populated with a wide variety of ATPases, exchangers, and transporters. As far as they know, ion channels have not been described for this membrane, as this would disrupt the complex endolymphatic electrical gradient. However, once in marginal cells, 
Steiger and his colleagues hypothesized that aminoglycosides can move into endolymph via a variety of mechanisms that include permeation of hemichannels, which are gap junctions with the extracellular fluids, and facilitated glucose transporters that traffic glucose down the concentration gradient. And there are also ion channels, including at least two trip channels that are expressed near the apical surface of marginal cells, such as trip V4, which has been shown to enhance the cellular uptake of aminoglycoside antibiotics, and trip V1, which has been shown to play a role in the cellular uptake of aminoglycosides. Once the aminoglycosides are in the endolymph, which has an electrical potential of plus 80 millivolts, there is a tremendous driving force acting on the cationic aminoglycosides to enter the negatively polarized hair cells, where they are known to cause hair cell dysfunction and cell death. Autotoxic drugs, such as aminoglycosides, are only given to sick patients with infections. Unfortunately, most preclinical autotoxicity studies only use healthy subjects. Therefore, Dr. Steiger's laboratory set out to study the effect of systemic inflammation on the cochlear trafficking of aminoglycosides and autotoxicity. Studies have shown that the blood-brain barrier permeability can be modulated by a systemic inflammatory response to gram-negative bacteria and that injections of bacterial lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, mimic a gram-negative bacterial infection. Therefore, Steiger and his colleagues hypothesized that LPS-induced inflammation modulates cochlear trafficking and autotoxicity. The following slide shows the results of this study that was published in Science Translational Medicine. These images show GTTR in the stria vascularis. The upper image is a cross-section of the lateral wall, showing that the stria vascularis is well labeled with GTTR compared to the unlabeled spiral ligament. The four lower images are different focal planes, perpendicular to the cross-section at the top, in the stria vascularis and spiral ligament of the cochlear lateral wall, showing the individual cell layers of the marginal cells, the intrastrial layer, the basal cells, and the fibrocytes in the spiral ligament. When mice were treated with LPS for 24 hours, followed by a GTTR treatment for one hour, enhanced GTTR uptake was observed at all levels of the lateral wall. To ensure that the enhanced streal uptake shown in the previous slide was not due to increased exposure to the drug due to enhanced serum levels of GTTR, they did dose-response experiments to determine the effect of LPS exposure for 24 hours on serum uptake levels of GTTR one hour after administration. They found that higher LPS doses at 2.5 and 10 mg per kilogram significantly increased serum levels, most likely due to poor renal function due to endotoxemic shock. However, lower LPS levels at 0.1 and 1 mg per kilogram LPS did not alter serum pharmacokinetics from that seen in control mice. Thus, they used this dose for subsequent experiments. To verify that native gentamicin levels were also not affected by LPS-induced inflammation, they did ELISA studies on both serum and cochlear levels for GTTR and gentamicin. In serum, they found that 1 mg per kilogram LPS for 24 hours does not significantly affect serum levels of either GTTR or native gentamicin compared to their time-matched non-endotoxemic mice. Yet when they looked at cochlear tissues, they detected increased levels of both GTTR and gentamicin. They also tested whether 1 mg per kilogram LPS for 24 hours induced inflammation and found that in serum, selected inflammatory markers were all elevated, including IL-1 beta and IL-10. When they detected these same inflammatory markers in cochlear tissues, they could see there was a baseline level for all markers. And at 6 and 24 hours after LPS injection, most, but not all, markers were elevated. The cochlear levels of IL-1 beta and IL-10 were not elevated, despite increased levels in serum, suggesting that inflammatory markers in serum are not passively transported across the blood labyrinth barrier. 
To further test whether the streal blood labyrinth barrier was compromised by exposure to LPS for 24 hours, they used biotin, a well-validated tracer of paracellular flux. Neonatal P6 mice with immature and leaky blood labyrinth barriers were used for experiments, and they saw a large fold increase of exogenous biotin levels over endogenous biotin levels. However, in non-endotoxemic adult mice, there was far less biotin in the intrastreal tissues compared to neonatal mice, and biotin levels were not enhanced by LPS treatment. Furthermore, the 1 mg per kilogram LPS dose for 24 hours did not modulate auditory thresholds, substantiating the argument that the blood labyrinth barrier remained intact during LPS exposure. Other studies have shown that the breakdown of the blood labyrinth barrier induces substantial auditory threshold shifts in mice. Therefore, they tested the hypothesis that LPS-induced inflammation potentiated aminoglycoside-induced autotoxicity. They used a well-validated model developed by Yochen Schatz Group in Michigan, which dosed mice for 14 days at a well-calibrated dose that is known to induce a minimal degree of high-frequency hearing loss. Then, they supplemented that protocol for two groups of mice with three doses of LPS five days apart during drug treatment, obtained baseline auditory brainstem responses for all mice, and measured again at 1, 10, and 21 days after drug treatment. Three weeks after dosing, they found that there were non-significant auditory threshold shifts in saline-only and LPS-only treated mice. When mice were given canamycin only, they observed hearing loss at the highest frequency tested, 32 kHz. However, when LPS was given concurrently with canamycin, they detected far greater levels of significant hearing loss across a wider range of frequencies. Next, they counted the degree of hair cell loss. For control mice treated with saline or LPS, there was little outer hair cell loss, and when mice were treated with canamycin only, there was minimal outer hair cell loss at the base of the cochlea. Yet when mice were treated concurrently with both LPS and canamycin, there was substantial outer hair cell loss, particularly in the basal half of the cochlea. Thus, they concluded that systemic inflammation synergistically potentiates aminoglycoside-induced autotoxicity and that the very patients who needed aminoglycosides, those with infections, are also the most at risk from infection-potentiated aminoglycoside-induced hearing loss. Other synergistic factors like noise that potentiate aminoglycoside-induced hearing loss also increase cochlear uptake of fluorescent gentamicin, particularly in the stria vascularis. Several recent studies by others now show that noise exposure also induces inflammatory responses within the cochlea, thus suggesting that dysregulation of the streal blood labyrinth physiology by noise may also be mediated by inflammation. In conclusion, it is important to note that the risk of drug-induced autotoxicity has been underappreciated in subjects with infections. The data in this talk and other laboratories' studies have shown that inflammation exacerbates antibiotic drug-induced toxicity. Therefore, it is worth asking, are autoprotective drugs effective in subjects with inflammation? Additionally, a functional blood labyrinth barrier is crucial for cochlear hemostasis, auditory function, and to exclude cytotoxins. The Steiger Laboratory data shows that the efficacy of the blood labyrinth barrier is highly modulated by inflammation. This final slide acknowledges the Steiger Laboratory and collaborators for the excellent data and also the funding agencies that support Dr. Steiger's work.